Avatar The Last Airbender, aka The Legend of Aang, is a series with a lot of influences. It adapts a variety of mythologies, philosophies, theologies, and cultures, mixes them all together, and yet somehow it just works. Most people will recognize a heavy influence from Asian culture on the series. I would say the biggest percentage of this comes from China specifically, but there are also influences from Japan, Korea, India, and pretty much the rest of Asia as well. Then there are some influences from outside of Asia, for example on the Water Tribe which resembles Inuit cultures in some ways, or the Sun Warriors who resemble Mesoamerican cultures in some ways. Due to the series' varied influences, it is a difficult task to decipher which real-world sources the creators, Brian Konitzko and Michael Dante DiMartino, drew inspiration from. In this video, I'm going to attempt to figure that out anyway, and expose the real-world mythology, philosophy, theology, and a bit of history that inspired Avatar The Last Airbender, or which it is similar to. The show creators admitted some of their influences, but much of this video is my interpretation. I might address a few things from The Legend of Korra, but only as they relate to the world of the original Avatar series. I will not cover The Legend of Korra in depth in this video, but I may cover it in a separate video. Also, there will be spoilers in this video. So without further ado, let's get started. Water. There is no better place to start with Avatar of the Last Airbender than the bending. It's the first thing we learn about the world of this series in the intro of every episode. There are four nations, each with their own elemental bending abilities. Water, Earth, Fire, and Air. Although after the Air Nomads were wiped out by the Fire Nation, Aang emerges from a century-long hibernation as the last airbender and the Avatar, the only bender capable of bending all four elements. The four elements of the four nations are adapted from the four classical elements, an ancient philosophy or system meant to provide an understanding of matter or sometimes the energy found in nature. The elements of the system or the number of elements may vary from culture to culture. For example, in Chinese Wuxing, there are five elements, fire, earth, metal, water, and wood, although they are thought of as phases or processes rather than elements. In other ancient cultures, including Indian, Greek, Japanese, and Tibetan, this system includes four primary elements, very much like those in the Avatar world, water, earth, fire, and air. However, there is usually also a fifth element, translated as ether, space, or sometimes void. The Avatar series was probably most influenced by the ancient Indian concept of Mahabhuta, which was adopted by practitioners of both Hinduism and Buddhism. In some sources, Mahabhuta also contains a sixth element, consciousness. In systems like Mahabhuta, a lack of balance between the elements can be very bad, like it is in the Avatar world after the Fire Nation attacks. Fire Lord Ozai, you and your forefathers have devastated the balance of this world. This is why it is so essential that Aang bring back balance to the Four Elements and the Four Nations. Through the Avatar series, we witness more than four types of bending. For example, there is also metal bending or lightning bending, among others. But all of these are subcategories of the four primary bending arts. That is, until the end of the series, when we witness a true fifth bending art, energy bending. Energy bending isn't exactly ether bending or space bending like the classical element systems. I suspect energy bending is more influenced by the ancient Chinese concept of qi. Qi is a life force or vital energy thought to circulate through the human body and the universe. In fact, qi is referenced several times in the Avatar series, so it also exists in the Avatar world. The stomach is the source of energy in your body. It is called the sea of qi. The Lion Turtle tells Aang that before the era of the Avatar, they bent the energy within themselves. This is very close to the definition of Qi. When the flow of Qi within the body is blocked, it can have negative consequences, or perhaps in the Avatar world, block a firebender's ability to firebend. I took away your firebending. You can't use it to hurt or threaten anyone else ever again. The movements of the four primary bending arts are based on four different Chinese martial arts styles. For example, the movements of water bending are based on Tai Chi. The water benders, we more or less match them to the, the style of Tai Chi. Tai Chi is an internal martial art, meaning it focuses on techniques that affect the body internally, including techniques for Qi cultivation and manipulation. These techniques are thought to cultivate Qi within the body by balancing yin and yang, the two opposing Qi energies in the universe, and allowing Qi to flow freely through the body's meridians or channels. 
This is thought to boost the immune system and promote health, much like the healing techniques of waterbenders like Katara. In fact, in this scene, Katara uses her waterbending to unblock this character's chi, like the aim of Tai Chi techniques. He doesn't look injured. His chi is blocked. Tai Chi movements that promote the flow of chi within the body were adapted to portray the bending or flow of water in the Avatar series. The movements of airbending are based on another internal martial art of the Wudong school, called Bagua Zhang. Literally translated, Bagua refers to the eight trigrams of Taoist cosmology, which represent eight interrelating principles of reality. However, this art was most likely chosen to represent airbending due to its emphasis on constant circular movements and turning palm techniques, similar to a whirlwind or possibly an electric fan. Earthbending movements are based on an external or outwardly focused kung fu style called hungar. Hungar is a southern Shaolin style closely associated with the Chinese folk hero Wang Feihang. Fun Ding Chun. Hungar. The style includes techniques based on animal movements, five animals to be exact, but one of its more distinguishing characteristics is a very low, strong stance. This stance firmly roots the practitioner of Hongar to the ground, from which they draw their power, much like an earthbender does. The movements of firebending are based on northern Shaolin styles. Unlike the southern styles, northern styles aren't as firmly rooted to the ground. Northern Shaolin is more dynamic and includes a variety of punching, kicking, and jumping techniques. What makes these styles a good representation of firebending is their emphasis on long-range attacks and aggression, the preferred fighting style of a firebender. Although the last two martial arts styles are external and do not emphasize internal qi cultivation, all of the bending arts may have some basis in qigong or qi manipulation. In Chinese folklore and Chinese fantasy novels called wuxia, qigong also includes long-range qi blasts, like the fire blasts of firebenders, the long-range attacks of other benders, or even the hadouken in Street Fighter. There are many gods or figures in mythology associated with the classical elements and elemental spells referenced in folklore, for example in Chinese Taoist magic. However, the concept of four nations, each with their own elemental bending ability, is unique to the Avatar series. Bending can be interpreted as a literal representation of interrelating elements in systems like Wu Xing or other philosophies that emphasize balance and harmony with nature, like the ancient Chinese theology and philosophy of Taoism. The main principle of Taoism is to live in accordance with the Tao, or the Way. Summed up simply, the Tao is a path to harmonious living with nature, a philosophy that Fire Lord Ozai and the Fire Nation seem to reject. Ironically, the character in the Avatar series that most represents the Tao is a member of the Fire Nation. I'm referring of course to Uncle Iroh. Iroh didn't always live in accordance with the Tao, but after the death of his son, he began to see a new path, one that rejected the ambition and arrogance of his former life. Iroh started to go with the flow of nature, achieving an effortlessness of action, or Wu Wei as it's referred to in Chinese. Other members of the Fire Nation began to see Iroh as lazy and gluttonous, but in fact he was achieving a stillness of mind that allowed for the full appreciation of experience, including the experience of food, bathing, and of course, tea. These are all principles of Taoism. At times Iroh didn't adhere to the Tao, but usually this was only out of love for and a desire to help his nephew, Prince Zuko. Taoism is one of China's three major theologies and philosophies along with Confucianism and Buddhism, and all three of these had an influence on the Avatar series. Like Taoism, Confucianism is likely most represented by the Fire Nation, or at least the corrupt version of it is. At the beginning of the series, Zuko seemingly represents the opposite of his uncle Iroh's philosophy, but in fact he was blindly adhering to a foundational principle of Confucianism, that is, filial piety, a reverence for one's parents and ancestors. Zuko's only focus was to restore his honor in the eyes of his father, regardless of the cost. Positive aspects of Confucianism, like the development of morality and responsibility to one's community may be represented by other nations like the Water Tribe, in the way they respect and honor their elders and their community. I think it best if the airbender leaves. Fine! Then I'm banished too! The influence of Buddhism on the Avatar series is probably most noticeable in the depiction of the Air Nomads. The Air Nomads are a monastic order who shave their heads, wear yellow and orange clothes, and live in a temple atop a mountain, much like the Buddhist monks of mountaintop monasteries in China or Tibet specifically. Aang resists killing Fire Lord Ozai because the Air Nomads taught him that all life is sacred. The monks always taught me that all life is sacred. 
even the life of the tiniest spider fly caught in its own web. This is a basic principle of Buddhism, but there are also a few hints that the air nomads are influenced by Tibetan Buddhism specifically. The first of these is the avatar himself. Aang is the reincarnation of the previous avatar, Roku, who in turn belongs to a long line of reincarnated avatars. This is very similar to the Tulku of Tibetan Buddhism. Tulku are spiritual leaders thought to be reincarnated from a line of past leaders. The most famous of these are the Dalai Lamas. Tulku often possess a memory of their past lives when they are young, like Aang when he is in the Avatar state and the spirit world. The process of determining the Avatar by the Air Nomads is also very similar to one test used to determine the Dalai Lama. The Avatar must choose the Avatar relics among thousands of toys, while the Dalai Lama must identify the belongings of the previous Dalai Lama. Avatars are born in all four nations through the Avatar cycle, not only the Air Nation. But there are a few more hints that allude to the influence of Tibetan Buddhism on the Air Nomads, one being Aang's guardian, Monk Gyatso. Gyatso's name is taken from the surname of most Dalai Lamas, and if you've seen The Legend of Korra, you may know that Aang's youngest son has the current Dalai Lama's given name, Tenzin. The concept of the avatar, and in fact the word itself, comes from India, where Buddhism originates. However, the term has its origins in Hinduism. In Hinduism, an avatar is an earthly incarnation of a Hindu deity, much like the avatar of the series is an earthly incarnation of the spirit Rava, although we don't find that out until the legend of Korra. It is a guru, the ancient Indian term for a master of a field of knowledge, that teaches Aang to unlock all seven of his chakras and achieve mastery of the avatar state. The concept of the seven chakras or energy centers of the body originates from Hinduism but also applies to Buddhism as part of esoteric traditions known as Tantra. In traditional practices like Kundalini Yoga, unlocking the chakras is thought to allow divine energy called Kundalini to flow through the body from the base of the spine. And this process allows the practitioner to achieve a heightened state of consciousness or spiritual awakening, as it does for Aang. However, while he is instructed by Guru Patik, Aang halts this process due to his attachment to the physical world and Katara. This alludes to another Buddhist principle that emphasizes non-attachment as a path to enlightenment. Let all of those attachments go. Let them flow down the river, forgotten. What? Aside from real-world philosophy and theology, the Avatar series also adapts real-world mythical creatures, to some extent. The mythical creatures and spirits of the Avatar world are unique to the series, but they have some clear influences. A good place to start with these is one of the most ancient creatures of the Avatar world, the Lion Turtles. Lion turtles are likely influenced, firstly, by the Hindu concept of the world turtle, although this myth is found in a number of cultures. The massive world turtle supports the world on its back, with the help of four elephants that serve as pillars. Another influence on the lion turtles from Hinduism may be Kurma, the giant tortoise avatar of the deity Vishnu. In one Chinese myth, the goddess Nuwa cuts off the legs of a giant turtle and uses them to prop up the sky. However, the lion turtles are more likely influenced by the Chinese concept of the four symbols, or four guardians. These four mythological creatures are thought to guard the four directions of the world. They aren't all turtles, but one is the black tortoise that guards the north. This concept is similar to the lion turtles in the way they guarded and supported the four nations on their backs during the age of Rava. The lion turtles' appearance and the fact that they are part lion is likely also influenced by traditional Chinese and general Asian lion statues, sometimes called lion dogs. These statues are thought to symbolically protect palaces or temples in the same way the lion turtles once protected humans from the spirits. Speaking of spirits, in book one of the first Avatar series, we are introduced to Heibai, a spirit that protects a forest in the Earth Kingdom. Heibai usually takes the form of a giant panda, a symbol of peace and harmony in China. But due to the destruction of its forest by the Fire Nation, Heibai took on a more monstrous form. This form doesn't resemble any specific mythological creature. However, Heibai's name and color scheme are likely a reference to Heibai Wuchang, which literally means black and white impermanence. Heibai Wuchang are two deities from Chinese folklore who serve as psychopomps, or escorts, to the underworld. Two more spirits with a similar color scheme are found in a spirit oasis in the Northern Water Tribe's capital city. Tui and La are the moon spirit and ocean spirit respectively, but take the form of white and black koi fish, each marked with a dot of the other's color. This is a pretty clear reference to the symbolic depiction of yin and yang, the two opposing energies of the universe found in ancient Chinese philosophy and medicine. Ko the face dealer even refers to the two spirits as yin and yang, so the show makes it pretty clear that's what they are. Yin 
and young. When the Moon Spirit is threatened, Princess Yue becomes the embodiment of Tui. As the Moon Spirit, Yue is similar to the Chinese Moon Goddess Chang'e or Princess Kaguya, a figure from Japanese folklore who must eventually return to her ancestral home on the Moon. A third influence on Yue's transformation may be the Buddhist Bodhisattva of Mercy, Guan Yin. One depiction of Guan Yin is referred to as Water Moon Guan Yin. This image sees her seated on a rock, pondering the moon's reflection in a body of water before her, perhaps like the pool in the Spirit Oasis. Welcome. There are more than a few insect-like demons in Asian folklore, but none of them steal faces like Ko the Face Dealer. While his name is similar to Kao, a Japanese word for face, I suspect Ko is also influenced by No, the traditional Japanese masked theater. Ko's default face resembles an Onryo mask, or Vengeful Spirit Mask from No Theater. Another influence from popular fiction may be the title character from the 1991 film Zyram, which is an alien who also sports a No mask. And there's probably a bit of Kaonashi or No Face from Spirited Away in there as well. I know you're back there. The guardian of the library, Wan Shi Tong, has a Chinese name, which literally means he who knows 10,000 things. But I think this spirit's owl form is more influenced by Greek mythology, and specifically the owl of Athena, which is a symbol of knowledge. I wish there was some basis for the air bison in real world mythology because they are my favorite creatures in the Avatar series, but there isn't. The series creators admitted that air bison like Appa are inspired by the cat bus from Hayao Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro. Another flying creature in the Avatar series is a pretty common fixture in the mythology of many cultures, that is, the dragons. The Avatar world's dragons resemble Chinese or general Asian dragons, however their fire breathing more resembles European dragons. Asian dragons are typically associated with water, rain, or storms, and aren't known for breathing fire, although there are some exceptions to this rule. As I alluded to earlier, the tribe that guards the dragons, the Sun Warriors, resembles ancient Mesoamerican cultures in their dress and the architecture of their temples. Mesoamerican mythology does include dragon-like creatures, referred to as feathered serpents, like the Mayan deity Kukulkan or the Aztec deity Quetzalcoatl. The Aztecs also had a fire serpent called Xiuquat. This serpent is regarded as the spirit form of the Aztec fire god and was sometimes depicted as a weapon wielded by the Aztec sun god Huitzilopochtli. Kind of like the sun warriors dragons who taught Aang and Zuko the connection between firebending and the sun. Well, our civilization is called the Sun Warriors, so yeah. Aside from mythology, theology, and philosophy, the Avatar series also touches on a bit of history. For example, one of China's most notorious secret societies, the White Lotus. It is an honor to welcome such a high-ranking member of the Order of the White Lotus. The historical White Lotus was a political and religious movement based in Buddhism and the Iranian theology of Manichaeism. The White Lotus Society inspired a revolution that would eventually overthrow the Yun Dynasty and establish the Ming, like the Avatar's White Lotus who helped to overthrow Fire Lord Ozai's regime. This will be over quickly. General Zhao is likely named after Zhao, a Chinese state during China's Warring States period. Zhao was known for its aggressive generals, like Zhao Kuo, who also may have served as a partial inspiration for the over-aggressive Avatar character. Although the only influence the creators admitted for Zhao was the villain in the movie The Patriot, who, not coincidentally, was played by Jason Isaacs, the same actor who voiced Zhao. The city of Ba Sing Se has a pretty blatant nod to China, which is the Great Wall that surrounds the city. A less obvious nod to Chinese history is the name of its secret police, the Dai Li. This name is taken from a real-life spy master, head of Chinese military intelligence, and chief of the Chinese secret police during the first half of the 20th century. I suspect Dai Li not only in inspired the name of Ba Sing Se's secret police, but also its head in the first series, Long Fang. It is the strict policy of Ba Sing Se that the war not be mentioned within the walls. Well, that's all I'm going to cover in this video. I didn't cover everything in the Avatar series because this video would get very long and tedious if I did. If you noticed a reference to real-world mythology, philosophy, or history in the first Avatar series that I missed, 
please let me know what it is in the comments below, or let me know what I got wrong. Brian Konitsko and Michael Dante DiMartino could have made yet another fantasy series inspired by European mythology, but instead they decided to delve more into Asia, and I'm so glad they did. Even M. Night Shyamalan's film adaptation cannot tarnish the original series in my mind. We can only hope that the upcoming Netflix adaptation finally does the original series justice. If you enjoyed this video, check out my video on Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, give the video a like, subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified of new videos that delve into the mythology behind your favorite shows, movies, and sometimes video games. Thanks for watching, and until next time.